The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. We're all concerned about scams on the telephone, on the internet, and now even on our phones. Here with us today is Ryan Sothan. He's the Outreach Coordinator at the Nebraska Attorney General's Office dealing with those scams. He's a wonderful friend of the program, has all kinds of interesting tips for you. Don't go away. Everybody, welcome to Live and Learn. My name's Kim Hachia. Today, my guests are gonna be Jim McKee and Ed Zimmer, and we're gonna be talking about their new book, which is called Lincoln. Hi, I'm Barb Tyler. Today, I'll be talking with Nick Faustman, who's with the Alzheimer's Association of Nebraska. He'll be talking about why this is such an important topic right now and how to get involved. Most falls among older people are due to eyesight problems or other physical mobility problems, or also due to hazards in our living space. But there are tips that we can follow to help us avoid those falls. Stay tuned for an interesting discussion on those tips and what we can do to avoid falls during those senior years. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Nobody wants to get scammed. Nobody wants to uh, make a mistake and give away their personal information. Nobody wants to um, throw money away to, to somebody who's just trying to take their money. Uh, and we all think we're pretty smart and not uh, going to be conned uh, in those kinds of things. But sometimes it happens. And sometimes these people are really good and we wanna make sure uh, and give you some help and some ideas to make sure that that doesn't happen. So back with us again is uh, Ryan Sothan. He is the Outreach Coordinator for the Nebraska Department of Justice in the Office of the Attorney General. Ryan, thanks for agreeing to come back and talk to us today. Happy to be back, thank you. So these people are good. Um, these scammers are professionals. Um, you have to be careful. Indeed you do. They, they are more practiced at this craft than we are at rebuffing them. So watch for their ability to engage you emotionally and then apply urgency to get you to act, not now, but right now, based on the compelling storyline that they're spinning. Yeah. Okay, so um, we, had, we had gone through a, f a few of the, the more popular scans um, the last time you were on. Let's sort of just continue on down that okay. list and, and, and see where we go. Online shopping, we, we had sort of touched on it uh, a little bit, but that really is a big one, and as you say, it's, it's sort of COVID-related. It is COVID-related because uh, many of us have been fearful of uh, uh, straying far from home, what with masking requirements and the like, so we're moving more of our purchase behavior online. And as we move online, some of the most often reported scams are, I ordered the product and it was never delivered. Or I ordered the product and it wasn't as advertised. What I got was something completely different. Or let's say an item of clothing, it didn't fit. And now I had expensive uh, uh, charges that I wasn't aware I was going to have to assume to return the item and there was a restocking fee of 10, 15, 20%. So those are the primary uh, online shopping complaints. But in the, and I think we mentioned this in the last show, we've also seen a uh, spike in imposter scam calls uh, from online shopping companies, most notably Amazon, where the fraud department is reaching out about a purchase that you may have made or someone fraudulently made in your name and on your account, and it's designed to uh, basically elicit your personal information and steal from you that way. Yeah, that's the one that I've gotten. They say, uh, we're just trying to double check, you made a purchase for you know X number of dollars, and, and I, I just immediately hang up. But it also comes um, through the internet, through emails. It does. In, in some instances. And you can see how this is compelling because you appreciate the notice. You feel that uh, uh, the company is looking out for your best interest and then voluntarily stepping in to reverse the charges. When in fact you're not dealing with Amazon or PayPal or Apple or uh, United Postal Service at all, you're dealing with the scammer. So, as we always say, and I want to make sure I get it into this program, if you did not originate the call or the contact, if it's an email, do not give out the information. Independently verify, reach out, and when you're certain of whom you're talking to, then you can be much more confident in giving the information. Yeah, that's such great advice because, again, these people are convincing. 
They are very convincing. Quite practiced at their craft. Yes, they are. Okay. Um, here's one. Uh, travel, vacations, and timeshares. And um, boy, I, I get these a lot. Um, and they sound great. They, <laughs> it's a free vacation, <laughs> right? They do sound great. Read the fine print. Uh, timeshares, once you've signed on the bottom line, it is very, very difficult to get out from under. Yeah. And there's a whole industry that has grown up around timeshares, and that's timeshare relief, how to get out of the timeshare. So just be sure you read all of the detail. If you are going to go on the vacation, show up for the 90 minutes or two hour presentation, but read the fine print. Yeah, not all timeshares are terrible. Not all timeshares are. Um, uh, and the vacation ones, uh, what, what about those? I mean, are those, I mean, somebody's offering you a free vacation. All you have to do is pick your location. There are key terms and conditions. Those are typically disclosed in uh, fine print that you'll need a magnifying glass uh, to read. <laughs> and again, it's very important that you show up for the presentation because the, the promised free vacation will become a charged vacation if you fail to show. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Banks and lenders. Um, this is uh, uh, sort of a new one um, for me. What, what are we talking about with banks and lenders? Well, there are, there's so much that qualifies now for uh, uh, financial transactions. As banking has moved increasingly online and you can secure a home loan, an auto loan, a refinance, uh, all digitally without ever stepping into a brick and mortar facility. But the complaints that we're receiving are over service and account fees, overdraft charges, uh, uh, mortgage terms, mortgage lending practices, low advertised rates, high uh, in effect rates, and just seeking overall clarification when it comes to uh, these loan products. And then if loans move into default, mortgages moving into default, the complaints that we get in terms of loan servicing as well. Now, I don't, I don't get these, but my wife will get these um, through email um, pretty regularly that um, a really well-known um, financial organization that we're associated with is just wanting to verify some information. Can you just verify your account information for us? I'm highly suspicious of any and all solicitations of that type, and this underscores the point. If you didn't originate the contact, don't give out the information. If this is your financial institution, then I would, uh, uh, to overcome my own inner skeptic, pick up the telephone and call into the institution or to my representative and verify the information that way. I would not respond to a request online in an email or, as you had mentioned previously, a text message at all. Right, and I, I will always say, do not do that. We have somebody we work with. They have our information. They know exactly uh, what we have. Just get rid of that and, and tell them um, that scammers are out there Agreed. And, and doing that. Okay, uh, telephone and mobile services. Well, we have uh, an awful lot of uh, concern over the second or third most expensive bill in the average consumer household today is their cable and phone bill. So uh, there are, are many come on offers or solicitations uh, that consumers have complaints with service charges uh, on the phone, apps and other applications that aren't working as advertised or contracts that are very difficult to get out of. And so they reach out to our office for help because they haven't read the service agreement or the fine print and find themselves uh, uh, mired with a service that is either underperforming or not to their satisfaction. Yeah, there was one a couple of years ago where we got the phone call which uh, trying to get us to change to somebody, a different company, and much and the same service and much less, fewer, smaller rates, and uh, and uh, so we called up the, we called up Spectrum, I think it was, and said, and they go, no, this is a scam that's going around. Do not fall for this. Very good. And there are also people who want to upgrade their phones, and there can be conditions on that phone upgrade, and so. Uh, by all means, reach out to our office. We can typically help in terms of uh, uh, resolving any dispute. One of the surprising ones for me was this one ring call where, where scammers will call up, it'll ring once, then it hangs up, and you look at the number and you wonder who it was that was trying to call you, and so you call the phone back, 
and all of a sudden it kicks into this very expensive either international rates or mm -hmm. premium rates of some kind. I hadn't heard about that one. That's very well described by you and it has been around now for about three years and seems to stick in the mind of uh, consumers within the segment that, that we're addressing. Uh, it is an attempt to trick you into calling back out of curiosity alone for the purposes that you've already described that once I make the call I'm now calling typically internationally at very high per minute rates. There used to be, and this is going way back, uh, something known as a 900 number and uh, companies would advertise to get you to call that 900 number without telling you that the charges associated with that 900 number were astronomical. This is similar in uh, effect, certainly in impact to that type of 900 call, but it's to get you to call back out of curiosity. Before we run out of time, um, let's talk about romance scams um, because I, I think you mentioned that this one is really becoming prevalent and it is a big money operation now. It is a big money operation and it has soared to uh, well over the $500 million loss level in the past year nationally. Uh, I get an awful lot of heartbreaking calls from adult children of uh, seniors who have been taken in. Let's face it, uh, COVID had us the past two years largely sheltering in place. And as we're uh, alone in our homes or in our condominiums, uh, we might be online or reading email and someone reaches out to us through either a dating profile online or through social media, Facebook especially. Uh, and they begin to tell us the things that we've longed to hear. Again, this gets to the art of the storyteller because the storyteller is going to have a very quick profession of affection and the uh, unsuspecting uh, recipient is going to believe the storyline and what happens is that ultimately there's going to be a money ask and that money ask is going to be significant and it's illegitimate. There are a couple things that I would like to recommend that seniors do along the way. First and foremost, there's a profile picture that's attached to any of these online uh, dating systems. Have your child uh, or a, a tech savvy uh, friend, they can copy paste that image into a search engine and show you definitively how many times that profile picture has shown up on other profiles or across the internet as maybe stock artwork. Second, convince this uh, uh, love interest, if you will, uh, that seeing is believing and that you would like to video conference with them. It's so easy today with FaceTime and uh, uh, Skype and, and Zoom to interact visually via the digital medium. The scam artist will never allow themselves to be caught on camera because they won't look like their profile picture. Right. Very good. Okay, um, we're going to run out of time, but there's a couple of things that I think uh, we, we still need to do. Let's, okay. Um, there's a, there are some really uh, key things that people ought to remember. If we could sort of put that graphic up and, and one of those is if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Our number one maxim, and that is always the safeguard. This gets to the art of the storyteller, too, too good to be true, too compelling to ignore. Uh, if it gets you emotionally engaged and has you questioning, it's probably a scam. Government agencies, uh, we didn't get to talk too much about this, will probably never call you. So the IRS will never call you. Medicare will never call you. Social Security will never call you. Isn't that? They reach out via good old U.S. mail, and you are quite correct. They will not call you. If it's someone posing as a government agent, it's likely a scammer. And uh, never give out personal information. Absolutely not. If you didn't originate the call, don't give out the information. Okay. Uh, and... Um, Let's, let's talk about how people can, can get in touch with your office. Um, uh, we have phone number. Uh, I think there's a, uh, a URL that we can, we can talk about. One of the things we wanted to talk about was um, uh, things that caregivers can do. I mean, you sort of said you, you're getting a reach out from sometimes adult children, and maybe they're acting as caregivers as well. When they call your office, you can help them through that process. Absolutely. And we have materials that are available online or that we're happy to mail to them on preventing senior fraud or our identity theft consumer guide. But the most important thing is that the caregivers start the conversation about the prevalence of these scams, maybe pivoting right off of this program to talk in greater detail because the primary 
issue that we have is we know the scams are occurring, but they aren't reported at anywhere near the rate that they're incurring. The actual incurred rate's over 20 times greater. So start the conversation now so that uh, uh, the senior knows that they're not alone, but that the most important thing that they can do is to report to someone, our office especially, for help and to stop the scam if they've dug a hole from digging in deeper. And let's quickly take a look at a phone number and um, where they can where they can get a hold of you. Reach out to us at 402-471-2682. Press option one. You'll be connected to a live operator in our consumer affairs response team. All of our information is available online at protectthegoodlife.nebraska spelled out dot gov. Ryan, I wish we had more time. So Thank do you I. So thanks much. for having me. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for tuning in today. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Again. Make sure that you stay safe and stay healthy. Hang on to your money and your personal information. And always remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Hi everybody, welcome to Live and Learn. My name is Kim Hachia. Thanks a lot to LNK TV and to Aging Partners for producing our show today. My guests today are two um, well-known local historians, um, Jim McKee and Ed Zimmer. Um, they are both, they wrote a book during pandemic when everybody else was, you know, hiding in the houses and they put together a book and it's called, provocatively enough, Lincoln. Um, Ed has the, uh, he's the famous person who spent 35 years as the, uh, Lincoln's preservation planner, and he happened to retire <laughs> the day that the pandemic kind of shut everything down. So we have this lovely image of both him and um, Jim um, pre-retirement party. And so you guys had fun during retirement, the rest of us didn't, or during pandemic, I guess. So let's talk about this book, Lincoln, it's uh, postcard history. Um, tell, tell us about the book and how you guys got rolling with it. Well, the idea came, I guess, probably from a book which I had seen from the same publisher uh, by a friend, Oliver Pollock, uh, and it was an Omaha postcard book, um, which just got me thinking, I had a few postcards <laughs> of Lincoln, and who else do I know that has a few postcards of Lincoln? Um, and it looked like it was going to be easy to do because I knew Ed would have to do all the work. True. Yeah. True. So how many, between the two of you, how many postcards do you guys think you have? Well, my, my, my collection is a little bit more eclectic. It's Nebraska-wide, so I'm going to, well, many thousands, uh, uh, about 15 drawers full. I don't know how many that'd be. I think I would count mine in the hundreds, not thousands. Yeah. yeah. I usually say 10 to 15,000, but I really don't know because I don't know how many, the drawers are packed tight, so a bunch. So, Plenty to work with. So postcards really kind of had a heyday, what, 1890s to 1940s? Well, later than that, maybe. They, they okay. really started, what, 1893, I think we I think so. kind of uh, focus around the World's Fair in Chicago. And that's when they became very popular. And that's when the term penny postcard was probably coined. They cost a penny, and they cost a penny to send them. So it would make it sort of interesting, because what Lincoln's, what, 160-ish years old, Postcards really were kind of their heyday 40 years-ish. So really only 25% of our history is <laughs> sort of covered by postcards. But I know that from listening to you guys talk about this book that it's sort of a limited thing. They were only outside. There were certain events. So talk about that and then. Well, there's the, the title Lincoln is so broad. That's how the publisher Arcadia chooses to title these books. But it is a narrow slice of Lincoln history. But our earliest cards that we're showing, although the images on a few date back to the 1870s or 80s, most of them are 1900 to about 1920, and a few go a little bit later than that. So we're really at a narrow focus. Many of the postcards were issued by commercial entities or um, what a publisher thought would sell, so schools, churches, uh, sometimes the businesses themselves or street views. 
There are postcards of interiors, but, but we really couldn't feature that in any major way. There aren't a lot that show lots of individuals. There are, we have <coughs> William Jennings Bryan, a uh, nice view on his front porch, um, but it's, it's really kind of that narrow slice of what was issued uh, in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do know the count, we have 211 images in the book and 211 captions in the book because by Arcadia's um, formula, um, you, you supply Two image, typically two images per page, because these are horizontals, so one above the other, and a caption with each one, of a certain number of words, no more, no less. And so think haiku. Right. That'd be the, or limerick. Right. And that's why Ed had to do all the work. Ed had to do all the work. <coughs> because it, even at the end of the, the project, you had to have no more than a certain number of words for the entire project, meaning that it's conceivable he might have to go back and change some of the captions were perfectly adequate, but it is such a formulaic book. Uh, the first book that I uh, was involved with is Lincoln, and I realized that this, that was back in the 1970s probably, and I started getting orders that I knew right away uh, I was misleading people uh, from Chicago. They were looking for Abraham, and this <laughs> is even even more misleading in, in its way, but I think people will figure it out. It's like, is it Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln, comma, England. No, yes. it's Lincoln, Nebraska, <laughs> comma, USA. Yeah, right. there's that right. pesky comma again. Right. Well, I think we have some <laughs> images that are rolling. Why don't you guys talk about what we're seeing right here? Well, this is probably taken from the hill about where Richards Hall would be sort of taken off looking towards the north west, west uh, over where the field would be now. Uh, originally, the field was about where Richards Hall sits, uh, but it was up on a hill, and they said in the, if it was dry, it was like playing on concrete, and if it was wet, it was like playing in mud. So they're going to move to the north, and this is a, an image of a sort of, but not staged event. Uh, the university was in a period where the students were becoming a little bit uh, raucous, maybe, let's say. And the... Um, idea was to bring about sort of a, not a carnival, but... Olympics, they called yeah, it. Yeah, the Olympics. And this, but the Olympics included events like the free-for-all or the tug-of-war. Mm -hmm. This is on the old um, football field and appears to be, it's labeled the big fight. I found a newspaper account of this period and I think this event, that it was, it was quite successful. Um, fewer students were injured. There was one broken leg and one concussion. But no, that, no, no deaths. But that, that seemed to mark an improvement in, in the inter-class rivalries of uh, the early 20th century on campus. Well, I know when, that this field ran east-west. Yes, it did. And the current football field, and actually I think a, a lot of football fields run north-south. I don't quite know why. But, um, yeah, so this, and when they built, um, yeah, well, let's go on. Let's talk about <laughs> this. This is the... Depot? This is easy peasy. This is taken from probably, let's think of the O Street Viaduct, although oh. it may or may not have been. This, uh, this picture is looking directly from the north, more or less from O Street and the... From the south, looking north. Looking north, yes. Uh, over the depot there, the only building which still survives is probably that little building which you can only see the edge of, uh, which is the creamery. Creamery building on the right, oh, the old yeah. Beatrice Creamery home, still, still there at four stories. But the depot we see, an 1880 building, uh, was replaced in 1927 with the current depot, Lincoln Station. But this is the active, busy rail yard. The other thing we see in this view that's still there is the canopy. It's been picked up and moved around, but the canopy um, of the early 20th century um, still remains along what we call Canopy Street. Yeah, somebody we know named Canopy Street. That'd really? Be <laughs> well, yay, thank you for that. <laughs> Oh, was that a hard thing to figure out? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. M m many, many of my best namings are um, that way. Yeah. Uh, this would be what we call Government Square. It's hard to look at this view today because we'd be looking right through what's called Grand Manse, the uh, post office courthouse of the early 20th century. Uh, we're looking north, northwest at what was the, the Nebraska State Journal buildings. Uh, now is a um, construction site. Big hole. Um, 
And probably this view was taken by John Johnson, the African-American photographer who worked in the federal building as a janitor and took lots of images of work life and, and street life around his building as well as hundreds of views around Lincoln. And what we think of the old post office was built in thirds. So if we look clear on the right, we could have seen the first third. Yeah. Yeah. I also like that you those you could see the street lights there with those little yes. globes that hung yeah, yeah, those kind of disappeared. There too. is a and and, and one por a few portions of those, none of them have the Eagle Finial still there. Thirteenth and O here looking southwest. Um, this would be the Miller and Payne corner. In fact, these are the Miller and Payne buildings. This card is labeled with the date, August 8th, 1908, the hour, 11.30 a.m., and that was what they called notification day. That white little square uh, is a poster or a banner with William Jenning Bryan's image on it, and notification day was the day in 1908 he was told he had secured the Democratic nomination for President of the United States for the third and final unsuccessful run. By the Democrats, however, I believe the Prohibition Party nominated him again, but nothing came of ah. it. So. so this was the big parade from Lincoln Hotel, where the graduate is today, over to the Capitol celebrating Brian's uh, third run for the presidency. What I like about this picture is all those flags, mm -hmm. and I love the streetcars in that picture. This would make it very collectible. People collect postcards with trolley cars on them, uh, and as this one came out directly from O Street down roughly from the terminal building. Wow, very cool. Uh, the uh, county courthouse looking towards the southwest again. We can see the old jail, uh, which some of us still remember being there for a while after this building was torn down. Very substantial building. That's it. Cool. And that building sort of still there, except it doesn't have a cupola, right? It, it, <laughs> it, it survived um, up to the building of what we would call the county city building for a time, but oh, okay. now the law and court building. Oh, okay. Um, I was th confusing this it with the old city hall. Yeah, this is yeah. on the site where we are today. Oh, okay. Yeah, th this okay. is the county this city site of the original 1867 plan of Lincoln. And it occupied one square block. Now, now we're the building occupies. Yeah. Right. The governor's mansion, which uh, started out by Mr. Thompson's house, which sat directly to the south of the Capitol building, uh, and it'd be on the east edge of the property where the governor's mansion sits now. And this Mr. Thompson was uh, noted for having started the Lincoln Star newspaper. Oh, and excellent. Then he, and Mr. Thompson and his wife went off into diplomatic service in Brazil and Mexico, and they sold the building to the state, served as the governor's mansion from about the turn of the 20th century till the 1950s when it came down for the current building. This is a Ferris wheel. Is this at the fair? Out at the fair, yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. I don't remember that this one is dated, but certainly from the clothing we can see it's probably dated in the 1900-1910 era, uh, at one of the very risque rides of the day. <laughs> right. And the Midway, which came about almost from the beginning. Right, very cool. So. What did, did you guys learn anything new from doing this postcard book? Well, we always find some little thing in a, in a picture which is new uh, to us, I guess. I'm not sure that the images we chose are all pretty well known, so I don't know. I think the thing that probably was the most learning experience was the aeronautics one, which we have a, had we have a picture a of a tiny little airplane. <laughs> 1912 at the fair, we were able to, by the, by the particular design of the plane, the early planes at the fair from 1910 and 11 were biplanes, and this was a monoplane, and that was a rare occurrence appearance in 1912. So we were able to pin it down pretty far, and the caption includes the name of the pilot. Um, I, it wasn't a new learning, but I learned I enjoy working with Jim, and um, we produced something that hopefully people will pick up and, and find something of value. This is our yeah. third book. It is. Yeah. The second with Arcadia. Yeah. And if people wanted to purchase this book, would they, they could get it just local bookstores yeah. or find, find book establishments like the pharmacy? Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, even the drugstores carry this one. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I treasure my copy of this book. I think it's great. I enjoyed um, looking through it and reading the captions and learning a little bit more about the, the city that I grew up in and that I enjoy, have enjoyed living here. And I've always enjoyed every conversation we've had with you, too, because you... I always learn something new, and you guys are very gracious guests. And I Hopefully think it's not something just made up on the spur of the moment. 
Thank uh, you for having us, Ken. Yeah. Well, thank you. I guess we're out of time. Um, but I would like to um, remind our viewers that it's never too late to live and learn about the city that you live in, Lincoln, Nebraska. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Hello, I'm Barb Tyler, and I'm delighted to welcome today Nick Faustman, who's the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the Alzheimer's Association of Nebraska. Nick, welcome. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the association, uh, the mission, uh, how it's active here in Lancaster County, and any goals that's set? For this coming year? Sure. The mission of the Alzheimer's Association is to lead the way in ending Alzheimer's disease and other dementias by accelerating global research, driving risk reduction and early detection, and by maximizing quality care um, and support. And we do that here in Lancaster County in, in a number of ways, really. We're, we're uh, working to increase concern and awareness through educational programs for not only uh, people living with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and their caregivers, but the general public, um, as well as uh, increasing the programs that are offered for care and support. Uh, we also are relentlessly raising funds for um, disease research. Um, and I might add that uh, we are also very involved in advocacy, that is uh, helping to pass laws that help benefit uh, Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers. Uh, and right here in Lincoln, uh, where we have um, a presence by every uh, level of government. So we're active in all those ways in Lincoln. Uh, in terms of goals, a lot of our goals are, have to do with expanding and growing the number of volunteers in our network. Um, there's, as mentioned, there's a lot going on and there's no shortage of activities that uh, one can get involved with if he or she wishes. Mm -hmm. So um, June is, has been designated as Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. Um, in addition to raising this concern and awareness of Alzheimer's and other dementias, uh, because there's plenty, uh, what's the particular message this year? Is there a theme to go around this whole month of June? Actually there is, and uh, this year's uh, Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month uh, has a storyline of uh, things that uh, people with Alzheimer's and other dementias would like you to know. And so it offers, offers an opportunity to highlight common disease related stigmas and misconceptions about the disease, uh, which oftentimes can have wide-ranging and, and harmful effects uh, for people who are seeking medical treatment and uh, keeps them from uh, living the best quality of life that, that might be possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something that we wish to address with, with this um, program that we're having, and it starts in June. Uh, June 9th is the first program, and it will uh, have, it'll feature a program every Thursday, uh, starting on June 9th, things like uh, music in the brain and activities that you can do to help stimulate your brain or activities for the caregiver, um, how music can impact the brain. And there's also a uh, research related uh, program that's scheduled for one of the days as well. Uh, so we're, it's something that we're really looking forward to. Uh, we do hope that it helps um, uh, kind of overcome stigmas that, that are out there about the disease. And we offer lots of different tips for for people in combating those those types of um, stereotypes, and you know, one if I may, one is to educate yourself and others around you about mm -hmm. the disease, know about the disease's uh, progression, um, some of the challenges that people with Alzheimer's have, and, and challenges of caregivers as well. Uh, two, don't make assumptions. Um, Alzheimer's and other dementias affect different people differently, and so. Uh, a diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean one thing uh, for one person means the other thing for another. Mm -hmm. um, people with uh, dementias do want to live uh, life as normal as possible. They do not, uh, nece they're not necessarily ready to give up their, their activities, their daily activities that they do enjoy. Um, and I think it's important to also point out that there is a stigma out there that Alzheimer's is only, it only impacts older individuals, mm -hmm. right? Well, that's not true at all. We, we see that Alzheimer's does impact people younger than 65 as well. Mm -hmm. um, another important thing to do is continue to show support for the individuals and for the caregivers. 
um, remember that, that the disease is impacting that individual. So there is someone in there who, as I mentioned, does still have uh, goals, dreams, aspirations, mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. the rest of us. So are these classes or meetings, are they held online? Are they held in person? Where do, I, I, we'll have a number up here later to, to find out more information, but are these, how, how do those classes or meetings work? Those will all be virtual. Um, and they can, uh, anyone who's interested in attending or viewing mm -hmm. uh, can register online at, okay. at our website. Good, good, good. So I know um, I, I have a little bit of a background in, in healthcare, and I know June is also one of the signature events is the longest day. Uh, can you explain the history of that and a little bit about the event and how people can get involved in this particular event? Yeah. I'd be happy to. Uh, the longest day is the day with the least amount of light, right? And so it marks the summer solstice. And on June 21st, thousands of people uh, global, globally will come together uh, to face the darkness of Alzheimer's and to uh, uh, raise funds uh, essentially for um, Alzheimer's research. And this is kind of like a DIY fundraising, if you will, uh, where interested people can do something that they love for people that they love. Uh, we've seen things, um, everything from car shows to athletic events or competitions uh, to bake sales. It, it really empowers individuals to do something that they are comfortable with to help mm -hmm. the cause. Well, I, know I'm, you know, I think my, most people probably are familiar with is the walk that's in September, I believe. It is. So that's why I wanted to bring out this because it is Brain Awareness Month and this, I think this longest day is really kind of interesting. So as you mentioned, dementia, Alzheimer's can hit at any age, and, but our population is aging and it's becoming more of a concern. Our, our aging population is growing. Can do you have any sh facts and figures to share about the disease and how people can become more informed, besides the classes, about the warning signs for themselves and for their loved ones as well? I do. Uh, there are more than six million Americans uh, age 65 and older living with Alzheimer's disease, and that includes 35,000 uh, Nebraskans. Uh, we, we think that it's probably more than that. However, the number of Nebraskans uh, living with Alzheimer's age 65 or older is expected to increase by nearly 15% just by 2025. And that's a very For steep years. increase, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, deaths due to Alzheimer's have increased an alarmingly 145% since 2020. Um, in 2021, 61,000 Nebraskan caregivers provided a total of 51 million hours of unpaid care valued at a total of $894 million. And as the U.S. population ages, Alzheimer's is becoming a more and more common cause of death for our population. And by 2050, a number of people age 65 and older with Alzheimer's dementia is projected to rise by nearly 13 million. Mm -hmm. And that, that's nationwide? Or is yes. Mm -hmm. I know, uh, so does the Alzheimer's Association help people, I know through support groups and meetings such as you mentioned, do they help with referrals to certain geriatric doctors? Um, do, what kind of other support do they yeah. get? Yeah, the, the great thing about um, our helpline, um, and we can provide that here when we're done talking, is that it provides, uh, it's like a one-stop shop. It can help provide um, information on uh, your insurance coverage or your Medicare, Medicaid. Um, it can offer, um, it, can, it can put you into touch with the proper uh, clinics that might be out there that can help your specific needs. Um, it helps with just about anything. Um, it provides a starting point. And uh, the good thing is that when you call the helpline, uh, you get to talk to master's level clinicians who are available to you um, in over 100 different languages. 24-7, um, 365 days a year. Um, it really is a one-stop shop for anyone. They can, if you call the, hot, the helpline, you'll be able to find what you're looking mm -hmm. for. So Nebraska is ready to cope with as this disease grows. So um, uh, where should someone go for help? You mentioned the helpline. To get more information, it's the same place. Uh, mention where your offices are. Sure. Uh, I know there's been some changes since the pandemic, but people might want to know how they, if it's something local. Absolutely. Uh, during the uh, pandemic, we did close a local uh, Lincoln office. However, we are reopen reopening a location out near 84th and O Street. Um, it will be ready to be opened within a month or so. And so, um, if you are looking to stop by the office, we would always welcome uh, stop-ins, uh, and, and you can reach us by our telephone number, and I, I'd like to provide the helpline if I might sure. uh, right now. It's 800-272-3900, and again, that is 24-7. 
uh, available to anyone who is in need for any purpose. And I just know a little bit too about the caregivers. There's mm -hmm. so many people that are doing it unpaid and I always used to say if, if you can't take, if the caregiver doesn't take care of themselves they're no good to anybody. So talk a little about the caregiving and make sure they're taking care of themselves. Can you just talk absolutely. about that? Absolutely, and you're, you're absolutely right in that it's, it's a very taxing situation to be put in, and Alzheimer's disease obviously doesn't just impact the one individual. It has a terrible effect on, on the spouse or the, the brother, the sister, the, um, the daughter, the son. Um, we do encourage uh, caregivers to get involved as well. Uh, we do help put them in contact with respite programs. Sure. Uh, we provide activities for them, such as the ABAM that we spoke of earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important that individuals who are, are uh, caring for these individuals do have some sort of activity, some sort of stimulation, because it is very taxing. And, and it goes back to the, um, the longest day that we spoke mm -hmm. of. Uh, because every day for a caregiver is really the longest day. Yeah, and the stress involved, I imagine, you know, some family members not who don't see that mm -hmm. particular person very often, they may be in denial a little bit, whereas right. the person that's on their day to day, it's, it's a different matter. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you, Nick, for taking time today to talk about the Alzheimer's Association and ways to get involved. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in today. And do know that it's never too late to live and learn. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Welcome to Live and Learn. Optical hazards can be a problem for falls as well as some hazards in the home. And it's good to have good eyesight to avoid these falls, especially for those of us who are <coughs> over 65. I'm Doug Jost and it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Brad Williams again with us for your, your second iteration here with us to talk a little more detail about uh, the falls. Let's get into that, uh, first of all, you do a little reminiscing or a little review of what we did in the first in terms of uh, how eyesight is really important to avoid falls. I think that's really important. It is a big factor, Doug, and I want to thank you for inviting me back for this second session. Uh, we kind of broke this down into the first session uh, focused on eye health and vision problems because uh, the study shows uh, the most common problem for seniors is uh, uh, falling uh, because their uh, eyes are not uh, corrected properly. Oftentimes their prescription's not where it should be. But you can have eye health disease, so we talked about eye health diseases, how it affects vision, and we talked about uh, prescriptions, how it affects vision. You, you have a, a favorite uh, <coughs> phrase, maybe it's, I'm not sure it's the favorite, but a, a neat phrase called surface hawk. What, what do you mean by this? Well, uh, surface hawk is probably the most uh, I would say most important tip that we'll talk about today. What I, it has to become a habit, and it's a habit where you're always looking when you're walking, whether you're in your house or whether you're outdoors, say like on the sidewalk or at the mall or whatever. You're, when you're walking or moving, you always have your eyes, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, focused about 10 to 15 feet ahead of yourself. So when you're walking, you're always looking at the surface, just like a chicken hawk is always up there flying, looking at the surface for uh, a mouse. Um, you need to be looking at the surface for something, such as an uneven sidewalk or something in your home that caused you to fall. Now, the key is you gotta learn it. It takes some time to do it. Uh, if you're walking with somebody, say outdoors, and they say, look at that, you need to stop. Then you can look, and when you start to move, then back to the surface. So I, I just guarantee you, if you become a surface hawk, it will reduce your chances of having a bad fall without question. Is there a space here that you would there probably? Probably, you know, it's a little different for everyone. But when you're walking, probably I say, ten to fifteen feet ahead of yourself. And there are a couple other uh, phrases related to to uh, they're sort of related to walking that that you use. And one is nails to the rails. Right. 
Another favorite tip is when you're going up or down steps, you need to have your hand on that rail. And some people say, well, um, I was at a, a rest home the other day talking about this, and they said, well, you know, we go down, but there's so many people touching this rail. And I said, well, just carry along, you know, a disinfectant. Oh, sure. A lot of times they have a disinfectant machine, you can just, you know, get your hands uh, sterilized that way. But um, I, you know, when I was practicing, I would see patients come in who'd had really bad falls, who had even fallen forward. You know, they had black eyes, they busted their nose or whatever, and obviously uh, stairs are also one of the leading causes of bad falls. And then the other one is, is nose to the toes, which I sort of related to the, to the uh, uh, surface hawks, uh, yeah. I uh, presume. Well, it, it's related to that. It's also related, uh, very good, related to the stairs, that when you're going up and down the steps, always make sure you're looking down ahead of yourself. You know, obviously most of us wear bifocals. I don't mean you look right at your toes, but look out maybe two or three steps ahead of yourself, nails to the rails, nose to your toes, and it will reduce those falls you can have with your steps. Now, maybe eyesight isn't necessarily the, the key on slippery, but, but slippery surfaces such as the shower and so on, it seems to me that must be a, a, a real hazard, a, a real cause of falls, well, is it? Yeah, it is. Uh, bathrooms uh, are noted for bad falls. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you slip in the tub or the shower, uh, severe head injuries, hip injuries, wrists, broken wrists, you know, all sorts of types of injuries can occur from those slick surfaces or you trip over a towel or whatever. But uh, I, uh, for me personally, and I, you know, an occupational therapist told me, get something that has a rubberized sole. So I wear Under Armour uh, slippers and they really give me good traction in the shower. But I always uh, kid uh, patients and, and other friends, I say, Go to the hardware store and buy, buy a sign that says beware and put it in front of your bathroom door. So you, you're you always alerted you to the fact that that's where a lot of bad falls occur. You always think of that, yeah, good idea. Then uh, moving on to uh, something else, I, I recently had my annual physical and, and uh, part of that is of course checking your eyes and so on. But, sure. But, uh, assessment of your your physical capabilities is is part of this yes uh, very good point physical trainers have pointed out to me <coughs> excuse me through the years that as we get older our core muscles become weaker and then when we're walking we oftentimes shuffle you know we can even trip on our rug at home or on our carpet so those muscles become weaker, and as a result, uh, by shuffling along, it can create problems. So uh, they recommend that you have, and I do too, that you have a physical um, training exercise to kind of determine uh, your, you know, how good is your flexibility, how good is your core muscle strength, and try to determine, just like you did with your other examination, what you need to have to help you avoid having a bad fall. And better flexibility, better core muscle strength, better calf strength and so forth will definitely reduce falls. So this is maybe more than just going to your family physician to have your annual physical. Yes. What you're talking about yes. is, is actually in a gym or something like yes. that. Yes, uh, there's a lot of physical training people you know, in your community and they're extremely helpful you know, for just helping evaluate what you need to have uh, in, the, in that capacity. A lot of your, your tips here relate back to your long time experience uh, uh, with, with checking people's eyes and, and working with them on their eyesight. Sure. But that, that all came together uh, from that experience. But let's go back to what's required from, in terms of physical eye examinations. I think it's important that we sort of emphasize what's, what you right. think is the best route there. Well, uh, the studies clearly indicate for older people over the age of 65 that um, bad falls are due to uh, eyesight problems. And you can take those eyesight problems and break them down into two categories. One is eye health. If you have bad you know, eye health, uh, conditions such we talked about last time, 
dry eyes, glaucoma, cataracts, uh, retinal diseases, and so forth, would be one indication that can cause your, you, you to have you have adverse vision. Number two, then we talk about visual conditions, such as nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism. And you need to have both of those evaluated. You need to have your eye health examined from the external part to the internal part, uh, a very thorough, extensive test there, and then also to check the vision. Terribly important to have those two items to be, you know, uh, if you have good, healthy eyes, and it gives us a chance to maximize your vision with your prescription. The eye doctor that I uh, frequent <coughs> now has me on a one-year recall. Is that for people that are over 65? Is that, yes. is that pretty standard? Yes. Uh, the American Optometric Association recommends that we have an eye exam once a year, and usually it's paid for by Medicare anyway. But uh, a very thorough eye health and visual exam is imperative for keeping you up to date to help you avoid falls, uh, you know, from your vision. And um, optometrists are thoroughly trained to diagnose and treat eye disease, obviously vision problems and so forth. So it is, uh, you know, sometimes older patients will skip an appointment because it's too cold or they don't have a ride, but uh, whatever you do, uh, make sure that you have that annual exam and you have not, not just a vision test, like which is better, one or two, but they have a very thorough eye health exam, so you have that combination uh, examined and brought up to date. Maybe this one isn't necessarily related to walking and, and falling, but another recommendation you have for the care of our eyes is is night driving and using uh, some yellow glasses. Yeah, talk this, about this, that. Well, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I think it's very important. Last time we talked about, uh, you know, your retina, the back of the eye is the film, like the film of a camera, and we said you have the center of the macula where the cones are, and then you have the peripheral vision, or side vision, which uh, uh, the photoreceptors are the rods, and the rods are responsible for movement and giving us some night vision. The cones in the center, central vision, give us color and our sharpest vision, but they don't help us much at night. So at nighttime, if you wear yellow lenses, you know, you can buy yellow lenses that fit over your glasses. Uh, I even prescribed them back in the day for like truck drivers or people who are working at night. And I always told them, I said, if these don't work, bring them back and I will give you your money back. I don't recall, you know, anybody coming back. And I'm not saying they're good for everybody, but if, you, if you're gonna drive at night some, or at dusk, whatever, to go visit your family, grandkids, or go to the ball games, mm -hmm, or whatever, mm -hmm. I would highly recommend that you maybe go on Amazon or go into uh, Walgreen or whatever, and just get a pair of uh, lenses that have a yellow tint. And they're not expensive, and what they do, uh, like for driving, they reduce uh, glare and flare uh, reflections off of car lights. And like I said, probably seven out of 10 people would say, yeah, these help. The other three might say, well, I didn't notice much difference, but they're not expensive and they're probably worth a try uh, for those, uh, for that time of day. Dr. Williams, I'd like to come back in summary here to the, to the fall <coughs> situation. Uh, sort of give us your summary in terms of people like myself, over 65, the things that we should keep in mind sort of every day to avoid falls. Well, it's kind of what we've already discussed. The number one thing is to have an annual eye health and visual exam. Unless you have an eye disease, you may have to be seen, you know, more often. That would be key because vision is the number one problem for these bad falls. Number two, I would have a, uh, a good thorough annual examination, you know, to make sure you're healthy because a lot of systemic diseases affect your eyes. So like, for example, diabetes, that needs to be right. corrected. Uh, so uh, an, a very thorough eye health exam is important. So is a visual exam and so is a physical exam. And the fourth thing I would say is to go into a physical trainer. Some people are already doing that. Some people are exercising, but we have a lot of couch potatoes out there that really aren't doing much, uh, but it'd be a way to evaluate your flexibility, evaluate your muscle strength, and then they will tell you, in turn, you know, some kind of strategy or a plan 
to help you strengthen or improve those particular conditions. Um, that compared with being a surface hawk, which I think is number one, even though I'm listing it towards the bottom. Be learning, it, it is a learning process and you, it, you have to work at it, but like any other habit, once you get used to it, you'll use it in your house, you'll use it outdoors, and it'll be uh, very effective for reducing falls. Brad, it's been real experience to visit with you and, and I really thank you for sharing your experience uh, with your, your eye examination and the work that you've done with people when their eyesight. It's, uh, it's really helpful to bring out these points and thank you for uh, sharing your tips sure. with us. It's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Uh, it's a passion for me because I have had a couple of really bad falls. So um, that's given me a desire uh, to try to offer some tips for people, uh, not only over 65, but anybody maybe who, who's viewing this uh, to take heed to what we're talking about. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn about how to avoid falls during, especially during the age of seniors. <laughs>